Um, my name is Mehreen. I'm one of the pediatrics ST1s at East London uh, Deanery. And the case I'm about to be presenting is of a child who I was involved in the care of. Um, so the way, oops, second. Um, Yes, so um, it's a 14 year old boy who presented with a history of acute difficulty in breathing and wheeze. Um, the way I'm going to go about the case is I'm going to be talking a little bit about his acute presentation um, and then talk a little bit about the escalation of care to PICU. Um, and then the third bit, I'm going to just discuss a little bit about his subsequent transfer to the tertiary respiratory center where he was worked up for for what was actually going on. And that bit will obviously make a bit more sense as I go through the slides. Um, so without any further delay. Um, so initially, um, this is a 14 year old boy. He presented to his local DGH sometime mid last year. So in July, 2020, he presented with a history of having chest tightness and difficulty in breathing. Um, in terms of his presentation, so it was an acute history. Um, for the last two days, he'd been having some chest tightness, um, which worsened in the afternoon. Um, it was initially made, he initially felt better with 10 puffs of salbutamol. Um, it, there was a one day history of having the persistent tightness and he took 10 puffs of salbutamol again and did feel better. However, the reason for presentation to ED was that he was having worsening difficulty in breathing. He took the salbutamol, very partial benefit, um, continued to feel worse throughout the day and thus presented to ED. So um, in terms of his previous medical history, he was a known asthmatic. He was diagnosed at age six. He had been on regular serotired. Uh, he took two puffs daily, uh, twice a day. Um, and it was noted that he did complain of having exercise induced asthma over the last two to three months. So in the last two to three months, um, he just had these complaints of needing salbutamol during exercise. Um, he'd use this about two to three times a week. Um, so this so this presentation that we're talking about, it was, it was in July 2020, and his recent severe asthma exacerbation was in May 2020. Um, he needed inpatient admission, although he did not need any IV treatment and he did not need PCCU escalation. There were no concerns regarding his asthma symptoms until that summer, so he was previously fine in terms of asthma control. Um, so in terms of management, so he presented to ED with that history. Um, he received burst nebulizer therapy, hydrocortisone. Um, he was he, was, he had quite significant work in breathing. So he was starting IV salbutamol, IV magnesium sulfate, IV aminophilin bolus, and he was also continued on an aminophilin infusion due to increased work of breathing and wheeze. So as you can see, he received quite a lot of bronchodilator therapy and um, he was quite poorly at presentation. He was also on Optiflow, um, which was started to maintain his saturations. Um, this is a chest x-ray that was done um, at the time of presentation to the local DGH, so day one in ED. Um, the report says that there are bilateral per perihilar opacities in a finger glove configuration, suspicious for ABPA, no collapse of pleural fusion. What I can see right away is that this is not looking like a very typical asthmatic chest x-ray, um, and definitely there's no sort of focal there's no sort of typical pneumonia like consolidation. There's no signs of pleural effusion. Um, but this is what, so straight away, it was quite an unusual presentation of a child who was previously known to be asthmatic. Um, so in terms of continuing the acute presentation, uh, acute presentation management, sorry, um, he was admitted to the ward. Um, the child did not tolerate Optiflow very well, so he was just put on 15 liters, he was given 15 liters by a non rebreather mask. He was started in IV two-third fluids. And in terms of bronchodilator therapy, he was on hourly salbutamol nebulizers. The aminophilin infusion was continued and he received two further mag self boluses. Um, he was still working quite hard. So 
they did try to stop salbutamol infusion. However, it was noted that he was having some signs of salbutamol toxicity, so this was stopped. And he was starting IV hydrocort every six hourly. Um, of course, as I mentioned before, it seemed to be quite an unusual case of asthma. So it was discussed with the Respiratory Specialist Center who advised to commence an antibiotics and antifungals. So antibiotics wise, he was commenced on IV keftazidine, IV tobramycin, and antifungals wise, he was sat on oral itraconazole, um, and an LA spot was also taken, um, which is to check for TB. And as you can see, despite all well, despite all of this bronchodilator therapy, he still had persistent work of breathing as well as high oxygen requirements. So quite sensibly so, it was decided to escalate care and transfer to PICU. Um, at the time of transfer, his respiratory support was, he was on humidified face mass oxygen at 60% uh, 10 liters. He was on IV fluids, two third maintenance. Um, he was on four hourly atrovent, um, hourly salbutamol. He was continued on the amylophilin infusion and he was also on hydrocortisone four times a day. Um, so in PSU, so this is day three from the time of initial presentation at his DGH. Um, there was no further deterioration. Um, his oxygen requirement was gradually weaned down. So, so he was then on three liters of face mass. Um, the aminophilin infusion was stopped. IV hydrocortisone was stopped and he was sat on oral prednisolone. And the salbutamol was stretched from hourly to four hourly. And the atrovent was also stretched to six hourly. So the main reason for transfer was in case we couldn't get on top of the work of breathing and he would need intubation. But luckily he seemed to have turned the corner. Um, a CT scan was done and hopefully this works. Yeah, so a CT scan was done in PICU um, and this is what it was and we'll see it and then I'll, I'll talk through some of the changes. So as you can see, it's quite, it's, the CT scan shows a few changes. Um, one is, so just in terms of interpreting it, let me just bring it here. Just in terms of interpreting it, so this is the right side and this is the left side as we would see in a chest X-ray. Um, and straight away, you can see that there are a couple of changes. One is that there are some some widened bronchioles you can see here there's airway dilatation so that so my understanding which i've been explained is that the white bit is the rim and the black bit inside is the air so straight away you can see there are quite a lot of airway dilatation so there's bronchiectus bronch bronchiectatic changes. Um, the other change that you can see is that there are quite gunky looking over here where there's some kind of opacity. Um, this is more like, especially over here, you can see that there's some kind of white um, impaction. So this is suggestive of mucus impaction. And you can see that that's also quite widespread. Um, and the third change is peripherally, you can see this tree and bud nodularity. So the tree and bud nodularity refers to this branching pattern that you can see in the peripheral in the periphery of the lung. So that is suggestive of peripheral bronchioles that may be filled with either fluid or pus, and that signifies an atypical infective process. Um, so straight away the CT scan sort of confirmed that what we're dealing with is not a typical sort of asthma case. Um, and there is underlying a widened um, airway dilatation, bronchial, bronchial, small airway dilatation. And there's also mucus impaction that we can see. And there's the tree and bud nodularity that I just, that we just talked about that we can see in the periphery. Um, so yeah, this was just a screenshot that I put um, just to see, just to show 
again, we can see the mucus impaction, the airway dilatation, and also there is a bit of tree and bud nodularity that we can appreciate in the periphery. Um, so the report did say that the appearance favored ABPA with associative exudative bronchiolitis over TB. Um, and there's obviously a bronchiectitic change. So in PICU, we've talked about the management of um, difficulty in breathing and wheeze. Um, at this point, it was felt to be that the reason for exacerbation was unlikely to be an acute exacerbation of asthma alone. So there were additional investigations that were sent off. Um, so he had a sputum MCNS sent off, um, NPA, ABPA markers, IgE, blood film, mycoplasma serology, um, lymphocyte subset, EBV serology, tobramycin level, as he was in tobramycin, and the early spot that was taken at the local DGH was still pending. Um, as he improved from a respiratory point of view in terms of managing his wheeze, he was stepped down to the ward and transferred to the specialist respiratory center. So this is to sort of work out um, what the underlying diagnosis actually was, now that he was relatively a bit more stable. So at day four from initial presentation, he was transferred to respiratory ward. At the time, he was self-ventilating in air. In terms of wheeze man management, we were on four-hourly salbutamol, six-hourly ipotropium, and he was on prednisolone once a day. Antibiotics and antifungals wise, we were on the same that was started at the local DGH, so IV keftazinib and tobramycin, and oral itraconazole. He was found to be vitamin D deficient, um, so he was started on cholecalciferol. And um, in terms of just gastroprotection, he was also started on omeprazole because he was also on prednisolone. Um, so when he was transferred, he actually had a little bit of a deterioration in the ward. So he was transferred in air. However, his saturations were dropping. Um, so he was put on intermittent face mass oxygen. His salbutamol nebulizers were switched from four hourly to two hourly. And he did require an, an aminophilin bolus and as well as a subsequent maintenance infusion. And um, to supplement, to help his work of breathing, he received a further magnesium sulfate because the aminophilin wasn't enough alone. Um, but from there onwards, he did turn the corner. Um, his work of breathing, his bronchodilator medications and his oxygen were gradually weaned over the next few days. Um, the sputum results did come back, which grew aspergillus. Um, and at the, when we got those results, we switched the antifungal choice from oral itraconazole to IV ambazole. He was commenced on inpatient physiotherapy just to help sort of get some of that mucus out. And he was continued on the antibiotics and um, the steroids that we talked about earlier. So now in terms of sort of we working out the history again. So we revisited the history. Um, so we clarified he had been diagnosed by the GP with asthma when he was six. He had been given serotide, um, but this time he did say that he's not been on it regularly. Um, in terms of exacerbation of his chest, his underlying chest disease, um, he did note that roughly once every two years, he did have an exacerbation, where the main complaint would be difficulty in breathing. The exacerbation would require mum to take him to a &E, where he might require some oxygen nebulizer with sometimes a short admission. Never had any PCCU admissions, um, and he never required any IV meds up till this year. So episodes this year had been more frequent. So as I mentioned, this presentation was in July 2020, and um, he's had he'd had two previous admissions since that in that year. Um, he hadn't had any antibiotics or recurrent course of steroids, and there were no clear viral pr prodrome. Um, when he was well. Um, he did mention, he did disclose that he had history of a cough, which was wet sounding. Mum noted that the cough was first present when, was first noted when he was very young. It was associated with some yellowish expectoration and there was no blood tinge or blackish specks in sputum. Apart from that, um, there was no history of any chest tightness when he was well, no history of chest tightness when he was playing football, which required him to stop 
There was no heartburn, there was no recent weight loss, no history of obstruction in sleep, um, there was no exercise limitation, and there was no concerns regarding his growth. So apart from the, the wet sounding cough, the difficulty in breathing, was otherwise negative symptoms. Social history, he lived with his parents who were first cousins. Um, there were no pets, no smokers. The property they lived in was described as moldy. And in terms of tra foreign travel, he did travel to Pakistan earlier that year, um, where, but there were no known TB contacts and there were no visitors from abroad. Um, so at that point, we had definitely shifted away from the diagnosis of exas acute exacerbation of asthma. It was felt to be an acute chest exacerbation of an underlying chest disease. And the next part would be just working out what the underlying underlying lung disease was. Um, we had obviously the CT scans were quite suggestive of bronchiectasis, but the other things we had to check is TB and cystic fibrosis. Um, so in terms of TB, MAN2 done was negative. Ellie spot, which was done initially at the local DGH, was also negative. Um, sputum AFB showed no AFB. And the final culture results for the acid fast bacilli was negative for both TB as well as non-tubercular mycobacterium. Um, in terms of cystic fibrosis, we did a sweat test which showed normal chloride levels, so that was ruled out. Um, well, it was July 2020, so everyone got a COVID swab, and he also got a COVID swab, which was negative. Um, in terms of also checking for any immunodeficiencies, we did an HIV antibody test, which was negative, and his IgGs were relative. The IgG, we checked his IgA, IgG, and IgM, and these were all relative. So in terms of coming back to the bronchiectasis, so the CT scan from PCC, PICU admission did show evidence of changes keeping with bronchiectasis as well as ABPA. Um, the sputum which was sent did grow aspergillus, it grew aspergillus fumigatus, aspergillus flavus. Um, some throat flora was also seen and there was no pseudomonas. Um, in terms of measuring his IgE level, so his IgE level, which was initially done, was quite high. It was 20,000. Um, so the one on the 23rd of July was when he was initially admitted to PCC, a PICU. And the one on the 4th of August um, was after a roughly two-week course of antibiotics and antifungal. There was specific IgE to aspergillus fumigatus, specific IgE to alternaria, and specific IgE to cladosporium. Um, but the important thing to note is that there was evidence of a hypersensitivity response to aspergillus. In terms of his lung function, so um, he had his lung function checked, sort of initial admission to the respiratory ward. Um, and as you can see, his FE V1 was 58.2% of his predicted. Um, this was serially monitored throughout his stay in the respiratory ward. And as you can see, there is an improvement after two weeks. So when it was rechecked on the 13th of August, it was 68.2%. So that 13th of August was after a completion of two weeks of antibiotics, antifungals, as well as inpatient physiotherapy. So there was an improvement with um, his stay at the respiratory ward. Um, so the final diagnosis, sort of tying the pieces together. So this is a 14-year-old boy who presented with reason presentation. The CT findings showed um, so CT findings of sort of, sort of having tree in bud, and the, uh, the widened bronchioles um, were suggestive of an atypical infective process. The final diagnosis is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, so ABPA with underlying bronchiectasis. Um, this did improve with ABPA treatment, which was the antifungal treatment. This did improve with antibiotics, which was the IV caftazidine and tobramycin. And there was improvement with inpatient physiotherapy. So the fact that he did get better with all the things that would target the diagnosis that we're working with does sort of lend itself well to what we think could be causing him to be feeling so unwell. 
So in terms of management, um, you can divide it into acute, intermediate, and long-term. I've sort of talked about the acute management. So the acute management was basically acute weeks management, where we just escalated on bronchodilator therapy. Um, in terms of managing acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis, that was with IV keftazidine and tobramycin. In terms of managing acute ABPA, um, we commenced an IV ambazone, and um, he was also given prednisolone, and he completed two weeks of IV an antibiotics and antifungals in total. In terms of intermediate management, so inpatient physio, I guess it fits a bit with ac acute as well as intermediate management, um, but he did have physiotherapy. Um, after, he was also commencing a weaning, a weaning dose of prednisone, which was to continue even after he was discharged for about a month. After stopping the IV ambisome, he was also starting an oral posaconazole with a weaning plan in place until he was discharged and even beyond discharge, again, for roughly about a month. In terms of long term, so as I mentioned in the social history, he did live in a property which was noted to have quite a lot of mold. So one of the priorities when discharge planning was that he would have to move out of the home um, to a more suitable property. Um, in terms of the long term, um, he would also need long term physiotherapy at home. So he was taught exercises and there was a care plan in place for um, for this as well. And he would also need regular respiratory follow up going forward. So in terms of what I learned, so I looked after this child when he was admitted to the respiratory ward. And I think one thing which I learned is that all that wheeze is, is not asthma. So this is a child who came in with wheeze and obviously we escalate as for bronchodilator therapy, but his underlying diagnosis was something else completely. Um, and one thing which did stand out in his history that there wasn't any particular atopic history. Um, there, he didn't have any interval symptoms until of course, that particular year, so sort of May 2020 onwards. Um, and I also learned a little bit about long-term management of bronchiectasis because obviously it's quite different, as I mentioned, in terms of the acute, intermediate and long-term, it's quite different to that of asthma. So that would be what I learned. Um, so a little bit about bronchiectasis, which I thought I could briefly touch upon if we've got some time. Um, so it's basically a description of um, a disease process that features abnormally dilated thick-walled bronchioles and bronchi, um, which are inflamed and chronically infected. A major cause of bronchiectasis is cystic fibrosis, um, but one of the papers um, did suggest looking at other etiologies of non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. So a large majority of them is immunodeficiency related, um, but equally there's also a portion where we don't know why they have bronchiectasis. Um, some of them could be aspiration related, some of them could be primary ciliary dyskinesia, some of them could be due to some childhood respiratory infections such as TB, measles, adenovirus pertussis, and some of them could be due to a congenital structural malformation. So um, another paper which sort of um, described, well, that paper was mainly targeting on um, sort of how to manage pediatric severe asthma, but there was a portion which did discuss excluding other diagnoses. So it is worth mentioning that differential diagnosis can vary geographically. For example, TB might be a more common reason for bronchiectasis in some regions than cystic fibrosis. Um, so tests to help ruling out other diagnoses is, for example, if you want to rule out cystic fibrosis, um, a sweat test, which we did, genotyping for cystic fibrosis if indicated by sweat tests, um, primary ciliary dyskinesia, so by doing ciliary bri brushing biopsy, which this child was referred for, um, and then to rule out sort of other air airway malformation, inter interstitial lung disease, um, do a high resolution CT scan, and of course to rule out any kind of immunodeficiency, um, we can send off a set of immunological investigations including IgG, IgA and IgM, evaluation of antibody responses to anti antigens and vaccines and HIV testing. The paper also dis discuss um, in some cases whether to investigate for multi-system conditions such as Churg-Strauss or Wegener's granulomatosis, um, but overall the, the approach should be guided by history, physical examination rather than a battery of investigation. 
Um, and this is also a slide which um, just talks about, just briefly tying up diseases which can masquerade as severe asthma. So in children, it could be dysfunctional breathing, bronchiolitis, microaspiration, prematurity related lung disease, cystic fibrosis or PCD, um, any kind of immunodeficiency, a foreign body, congenital malformation, and some other rarer causes which can very, very uncommonly masquerade as asthma, for example, a mediastinal mass, congenital heart disease, interstitial lung disease, or connective tissue disease. And um, that's it. Thank you very, very much um, uh, for a wonderful presentation and uh, obviously very important to consider a wide uh, differential. I'm now going to hand over to Professor Bush. Um, if he's able to perfect amazing yeah. um thank you very much so are you are you actually seeing my slides because i'm not at the moment what are you seeing not not quite yet it's your email uh yes yeah. yes perfect Okay, brilliant. So thanks. That was a great presentation. Um, just two comments I'd add to that. The first thing is a practice point. If you see somebody with a funny acute respiratory disease, and as was so clearly present presented, this was not acute asthma, pure and simple, always ask about e-cigarettes because the list of things that e-cigarettes can do acutely is enormous. And um, the, the second thing for this child, if you haven't referred for exclusion of hyper IgE syndrome, I would, because that IgE is incredibly high. But now, anyway, asthma treatment's not working. What do I do? So no conflict of interest. I'm going to try to demonstrate that if tr this is good, now going to be sort of chron a, cro a chronic situation, not the acute situation that was so nicely presented. If treating asthma is not easy, the reasons likely lie outside the airway. And rather than giving more and more treatment, actually step back and reassess the child in an, in an MDT way. Um, I will briefly just touch on the monoclonals, but the main thrust, most children with asthma that's not responding to treatment actually just need to get the basics right. And that's the single most important take home message. So asthma that's not responding, one background slide, unresponsive asthma. This was, a this was a really important study. It looked at kids who were symptomatic despite being given inhaled steroids and long-acting beta agonist and asked the question, is azithromycin or leukotriene receptor antagonist better as an add-on therapy? And the whole thing ended in futility because they couldn't find any patients. The patients they screened were either not asthmatic or not taking treatment. And that's a really important message. And this was the Badger study, which took children who were symptomatic on fluticasone 100 micrograms twice daily and worked out, is it better to give them a big whack of steroids, leukotriene receptor antagonist or, or long acting beta agonist and what this paper showed was that very few was that very few uh, patients gained any benefit from inhaled steroid doses above 100 micrograms twice daily that's the plateau so this as i'm sure you'll recognize is christopher robin taking winnie the pooh upstairs and this is a bit like asthma treatment today christopher robin being the pediatrician uh, the, Winnie the Pooh is the child going up bump, bump, bump on the back of his head, thinking there must be a better way. Up all these largely non evidence based stepwise um, guidelines, and the beneficiary, a big farmer waiting at the top, making lots of money. And this is partly frivolous, but only partly. And the idea is it's the answer to asthma that is not responding to treatment is not a lot more asthma treatment. So what should be our clinical approach? So problematic respiratory symptoms, not responding to asthma therapy, um, diagnostic workup. Is there positive evidence of asthma? You know, what tests have been done? Is the child atopic? Does the child have reversible airway obstruction? Or is there evidence of another condition? And if the answer, if it's so, here you can see in this slide, this is a double aortic arch. You can get, you can give, you can give inhaled steroids till all's blue, and that's not going to respond to treatment. But if they're not responding, the next thing is an MDT evaluation, and I cannot stress too much the importance of an MDT. So what do they do? 
Well, adherence. That is the single most important thing that we get wrong. That there are various ways you can look at prescription uptake, but of course, just because you've collected a prescription doesn't mean you've done anything with it. We're increasingly using electronic monitoring. When our nurses in the pre-COVID days did home visits, was medication in date and accessible? So it's the major obstacle to effective management and the biggest single reason treatment fails, at least in my clinic. And there's the practicalities and perceptions framework for thinking about adherence. The practicalities, things like forgetfulness, a chaotic lifestyle, are the parents supervising treatment? Is the regime so complex? Is it the child doesn't want to be different and, the, the, and the take medicines? Or are there perceptions like lack of understanding of correct usage or seeing that inhaled steroids don't give you immediate gratification, uh, patient beliefs, worries about side effects? And we're using electronic monitoring increasingly and we see four groups of patients. We see patients like this one, adherence good, everything gets better. So here you can see, see here you can see on the vertical axis, daily number of doses taken each day on the horizontal axis. At the start of treatment, patient has a low FEV1, raised exhaled nitric oxide, a marker of inflammation. At the end of treatment, everything has normalized. And the only explanation for this is that they used to be, they were not taking treatment at this time. When they knew they were being monitored, they took treatment and alakazam, the asthma gets better. The next group are those with persistent poor adherence. They don't improve. This is either true therapy resistant asthma. They're just fed up with taking treatments that don't work or people who are just the hardcore non-adherers. The next group, good adherence, no change in asthma control or attacks. These are the true rare therapy resistant asthmatics. And the fourth group, those with poor adherence, but control is good, and it's likely these guys are being overtreated. The next, environment, cigarettes and vaping. We always check urinary cotinine. Um, nicotine is a cause of steroid resistance. Environment, if they're sensitized and exposed to uh, high levels of allergen, that too will cause steroid resistant. And psychosocial, anxiety and depression, and all, but also overcalling sy symptoms. And it's a really good tip is to ring up the school and find out what's going on at school. Uh, I had a child who was, I was treating for steroid, needing oral steroids for their asthma. And when the nurses rang up the school, they said, no, no, he hasn't got asthma at all. He doesn't have an inhaler. He's the captain of football and he never, he never gets breathless. And I was being led by the nose. So the idea is after evaluation, is this asthma plus, asthma with comorbidities? Is this difficult asthma that they need to get the basics right? Or the rare, true therapy resistant asthma? And these three may overlap. You hopefully, as a result of this, get a bespoke treatment plan, the multidisciplinary team, and hopefully they're no longer problematic if you've addressed the issues that are preventing them responding to therapy. But some remain refractory difficult asthma and refractory asthma plus. And the typical ones, non-adherence, environment again, obesity with failed weight loss. So refractory difficult asthma, the differential diagnosis includes exaggeration of symptoms for hidden or obvious gain. These are ongoing poor control or attacks with an ongoing tobacco exposure or poor adherence despite multiple efforts. As I say, beware, you may be dealing with a child who's so fed up with treatment not working, that that's why they're not taking it. On both ongoing adverse psychosocial factors, think the three D's, denial, depression, disorganization. Those are bad markers. And most asthma deaths are in this group. They're not in the, the really so-called severe ones who are being seen by me. They're in the community in this group. So if they're not taking treatment, is it because they're non-adherent because they don't think it's working? What happens when it's actually taken? So directly observed therapy, admission for directly observed therapy, intramuscular triamcinolone, do they respond when you know the treatment is being taken? And if they do, 
then it's directly observed therapy at school or by video link. And if they don't respond, these are the ones who need invasive airway phenotyping. Obesity, obese asthma may be different. They may have airways that are longer than normal. So they have a normal FEV1, a high FVC and a low ratio. They may be, their variable airflow obstruction may be related to atelectasis. They may have type 2 inflammation, but there's some challenging data suggesting that IL-6 from systemic inflammation can drive asthma, and they may have altered airway microbiome. And the moral of this story is think with obese asthma, do there, is this, this may not be the same as thin child's asthma. This is a really important one for you to know about, and people, if they don't know it, miss the diagnosis. 15-year-old girl, near Olympic standard swimmer, and she gets noisy breathing and respiratory distress at the end of the races and afterwards impairing her performance and doesn't respond to treatment. A diagnostic test was performed and we can all perform this diagnostic test. It's to take a video with a mobile phone. Let's hope this works now. This is the video. Listen to her. She's got stridor, hasn't she? Do you hear the stridor? She's got stridor. She's got exercise induced laryngeal obstruction. And you can diagnose that formally if you like. Um, if you can get a child to do this, good luck to you. This is a young man on, a, on an exercise bike with a laryngoscope looking at his vocal cords. And what you see as he exercises is his cords adduct. It causes stridor and clearly does not respond to asthma treatment. And absolutely critical, the three causes of breathlessness on exercise, exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction, and obesity and de deconditioning, of which this last is much the most common. So exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, it occurs in 90% of asthmatics, usually coming on after exercise, maybe even five minutes after exercise, harder to breathe to breathe out, and usually treated successfully by short-acting beta agonist pretreatment. Exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction frequently coexists with asthma, but crucially, symptoms are during exercise, they find it harder to inhale, they say that their breath sticks in their throat, they may have a sore throat or a hoarse voice afterwards, and it's not helped by asthma medications. They need to see the physios or the sports psychologists. Whereas obesity may be a story that they've got asthma, they get symptoms during exercise, they're generally breathless and not helped by, by asthma medications. And one of the key things we should be doing, exercise tests rather than jacking up the asthma medication if there's any doubt at all. So briefly, treatment options for the severe asthmatics. Uh, the, we, these are the monoclonals, anti-IgE, omalizumab, mops up the monoclonals, anti-IL-5 strategies, IL-4, IL-13, but in children, we've just got two, mepolizumab, anti-IL-5, and omalizumab. Omalizumab binds the IgE, preventing binding to the high affinity receptor. Uh, you can see the mechanism of action there, reduces uh, uh, allergic inflammation, type 2 inflammation. In the UK, you have to be at least six years old, have at least four oral prednisolone bursts. There's no logic to the oral prednisolone burst. If you've had one attack, you're likely to get more, so why wait? The dosage depends on weight and IgE levels. Um, at 1300, the upper limit of that you can treat, and many of my patients have a much higher level. Very expensive, and it has to be administered in hospital and with observation afterwards. Although our nurses have got a very good scheme, it's just published in archives, in which they do remote, directly observed therapy with monoclonals. Uh, Mepolizumab, it binds the cytokine IL-5, which recruits the eosinophils um, from, the bone, from the bone marrow. Um, it regulates the growth, recruitment, activation, and survival of eosinophils. It's licensed for children of more than six years of age, but there are huge gaps in our knowledge base. We don't know how many children are eligible. 
we don't have good biomarkers for response and we don't have a comparative study for omalizumab and it's really important we get these things but omalizumab and mepolizumab are something for specialist centers only after a detailed evaluation of the child and the problems so what then are my take-home messages from this whistle stop tour the first is, is that severe asthma is usually not due to severe airway disease, and most children with asthma will respond very well to low-dose therapy if it's taken regularly and correctly. If they're not responding, look for the comorbidities, look for dysfunctional breathing, get your physiotherapist involved, look for adverse social or environmental factors like poor adherence and an adverse environment. And the way forward is a detailed, multidisciplinary, protocolized assessment, not prescribing more and more therapy. There are, for the genuine severe asthmatic, do think about the new biologicals, but they are rare. They are rarely needed. We do use them for the severe asthmatics. We also use those for the refractory people who will not take treatment because we've got to do something to keep the children alive and we can't penalize them them because their parents won't give treatment. So thank you very much for your attention. These are my six grandchildren and the days when we could get together like that. Very happy to take questions if there's time. Um, Emma, you have the slides and if anybody wants the slides, I'm very happy indeed for you to sh share them. So I hope that was useful and thank you very much indeed. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we're now going, uh, if anyone has any questions, do put them in the chat. Um, I will just double check that there isn't anything in the chat. If not, you can email me um, and I can um, ask uh, ask Professor Bush directly. Uh, I'm going to hand Absolutely. over... Or please email me direct. You've got the email and the slides. I'm very happy to be emailed. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to do our uh, MCQ quiz as normal. So if you guys all log into Coot, um, uh, I'm going to hand over to her. Hello, everyone. You can hear the music in my background. It's Kahoot time, which we play every time we do an episode of Kids Exchange. Um, I don't know how to turn the music off still. <laughs> so... Everyone could go to kahoot.it, you don't need to download the app, kahoot.it and enter the game pin 8139356. Um, you can give yourself a nickname, it doesn't have to be your actual name. Um, I would ask you to maybe choose something respiratory related, could be a favourite part of the respiratory system could be your favourite drug that works on the respiratory system, your favourite respiratory disease. Um, we are playing here in St George's Kiku, um, so we can see who can beat uh, Nick Prince. So we've got a consultant in for our monthly Beat the Consultant Challenge. Um, there's about 30 of you on the call, so we'll give you a few minutes to everyone join in. I promise it's fun, it's only five questions. Okay, the bomb peel. PCD, primary ciliary dyskinesia, not bad, not bad. Well, let's have some more players. So be shy. Cough, okay. <laughs> not bad, not bad. Okay, I'm going to give it another minute and then we're going to start. So get your nicknames in. Good, some stride or just just the lesser eye, that's fine. Okay. I also think one of you has dialed in as a group, so I'm hoping that some of you guys can play. You can play as a team, but you know, it's maybe a bit unfair on everyone else. Okay, <laughs> so 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's begin. So, you're going to get a question. It's multiple choice. The faster you answer, the more points you get. So, 
So a three month old boy with coriza, weeds, fine crackles. What is the most likely causative organism? You've only got 20 seconds to answer, so you've got to get them in. Okay, five seconds. Make sure you've answered. Yeah, very good. So we are getting at your classic bronchiolitis in this question. Um, and of course, the most common one is RSV, which is responsible for probably about 80% of cases. But the others, actually, I'm not sure about coronavirus, but the others can certainly cause bronchiolitis as well. So at the moment, salvisimal nerves are on top, as they probably are in the NHS as well. Let's have a look at the next question. So a 12-year-old girl with three months of chronic cough when it started, she had a fever and erythema multiforme. Which of these organisms could have caused this presentation? Remember, these questions are all exam style. If you're looking for your pattern recognition textbook answer. Okay, I think everyone's just about got their answers in. Yeah, very good. So mycoplasma actually really classically you can do an erythema multiforme. Um, so worth knowing that because in a lot of other respiratory cases, it's not necessarily the most likely culprit. So let's see what that's done to our leaderboard. Okay, salbutamol nerves is still doing fantastically well, but there are only two points between salbutamol nerves and CF20. There's still everything to play for. So Speech. question three, um, a three-year-old male with cough fever and hyponatremia. I've chucked in the next ray here, which is potentially actually a bit irrelevant, but you can look at it anyways. What is the most likely cause of the hyponatremia that is part of his presentation? Yes, excellent. Oh, I'm actually really impressed with that. <laughs> so yeah, children with respiratory infections can really often get an FIADH, which then makes them hyponatremic. Very good. Okay, oh, salbutamol nebs has been displaced off the top spot by a stridor, but the scores are still very close. There's two questions left. A nine-year-old with cystic fibrosis has had a significant cough for the last year. This is her CT scan. What does it show? It's a very small picture of a CT scan, so that's exactly what you get in your written exam. <laughs> so see if you can look very closely at your screen and tell me what you think you can see in that. Yeah, excellent. It's that kind of slightly patchy, granular sort of appearance. Um, so that is showing bronchiectasis, which of course has many causes of which cystic fibrosis is one. So before going into the last question, it's still very tight. Salbutamol nebs is still in there, but type two, presumably respiratory failure is in the front. Or pneumocyte. Or pneumocyte, that's very right. Okay, so this is a sleep study from an obese 13 year old boy. What is the diagnosis? So you've got his saturations at the top and the breaths that he's taking at the bottom. What's going on here? Is it normal? Maybe it's normal, who knows? Very good. So this is obstructive sleep apnea, because as you can see, there's these little areas of kind of pauses with breathing that's also associated with a bit of desaturation. So that's all the questions. Who is this month's winner? So in third place, salbutamol nebs, a valiant effort, but maybe came out of the gate too fast. Type two is in second place. And the winner of respiratory case exchange is Strigal. Very good, very good. Nick, what was your nickname? Oh, okay, so Strigal has managed to beat this month's consultant. Very good. <laughs> well done, everyone. And thank you so much for coming to case exchange. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um,